Fellow Nigerians, the coup plot uncovered in December 1985 has been a shock to the whole nation, which rose like one man to condemn the coup plotters and urge the federal military government to deal with those concerned in accordance with our laws. After considering all relevant factors, including the judgment of the Special Military Tribunal and the recommendations of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on those appeals, the Armed Forces Ruling Council in a meeting held earlier today has decided as follows. The case of Brigadier M. M. Nasarawa is to be further investigated with a view to having a retrial. Those who heard about the coup attempt and failed to make a report to the authorities are dismissed from the armed forces and in addition are sentenced to terms of imprisonment as follows. A. Wing Commander J. B. Uku, 5 years imprisonment. B. Lieutenant P. O. Odoba, 10 years imprisonment. The category of plotters who did not belong to the hardcore but were on the periphery and took part in the preliminary discussion of the coup attempt are sentenced to life imprisonment. They are 1. Lieutenant Colonel M. F. Young 2. Major D. E. West 3. Major T. G. Akwashiki The prime movers of the coup attempt to hatch the coup plot masterminded it recruited others to join them and took the required military actions to implement it as sentenced to death by the firing squad. The officers in this group are Major General Maman Vata, Lieutenant Colonel Musa Bityong, Lieutenant Colonel C. A. Oche, Lieutenant Colonel M. Yoshi, Major D. I. Bamidili, Squadron Leader Martin Luther, Wing Commander B. Ekele, Commodore A.A. Oguji, Wing Commander A.C. Sakaba, and Squadron Leader A. Ahura. The officers who have been sentenced to death by firing squad were executed about an hour ago. The Armed Forces Ruling Council hereby appeals to all Nigerians and officers and men of the Armed Forces to be vigilant and continue to be patriotic and loyal to the government and the nation. This administration has bent over backwards to give the coup plotters a fair trial and a right of appeal. For reasons of our commitment to human rights and in consideration of the appeals made by various individuals and groups for clemency. Where there was any doubt, the Armed Forces Ruling Council has given the accused the benefit of the doubt and spared his life. In other cases, where there was no doubt, the death sentence has been imposed and executed. In the military, the punishment for treason is death. Okay, we've all listened to the problem. Now, what is the answer? Lieutenant the answer? Colonel Moses oh, Effion was an instructor at the Staff College. Since we filmed him, he has been jailed for life for attempting a coup. Moses Etim Effion was born on December 8, 1948, at Adiabo, Udupani local government area of Cross River State, where he also had his primary school education before proceeding to Calabar for his secondary education between 1961 and 1965. He joined the Nigerian Navy in 1966, entered the Nigerian Defense Academy in 1969 and was commissioned a second lieutenant in September 1971. Effion commanded three infantry battalion, Nigerian Army between 1977 to 1978 and thereafter had a stint at the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon as a member of the Nigeria contingent, he also served in NDA and Command and Staff College Jaji as adjutant and directing staff, respectively. The morning of Sunday, December 22, 1985, was colder than the day before. My wife and I had made up our minds to attend evening mass at St. Joseph Cathedral, Kaduna, as was our practice whenever we did not wake up early enough to attend morning mass. We decided to pay a visit to my brother, Mr. Paulinos Effiong in Zaria, whose wife had been delivered of a baby. We left home at about 9 a.m. 
without the children to avoid delay. After spending a few hours with my brother's family, we left Zaria at about 12.30 p.m. On the outskirts of Zaria, I noticed an army jeep driving behind us. We kept the same distance for about one kilometer. Little did I know that they were trailing me. When we pulled over at a point to buy some potatoes, they pulled over too. Then a young army lieutenant came out and pretended to be pricing some potatoes. When our eyes met, he paid compliments, drew nearer and requested to speak with me out of earshot of others. He informed me that I was wanted in Lagos and showed me the signal message with the text subversion. I went and told my wife, who at this time had become suspicious in view of the wave of arrest that had been taking place in the last couple of days. She abandoned the purchase, entered the car and we drove off, with the jeep driving behind. At Jaji, I told the lieutenant I wanted to inform my commandant, Major General Paul Omu, so we drove to the commandant's residence. He was not in. All this time, my wife was restless and was bombarding me with questions as to my innocence or involvement in the alleged coup. I did all I could to allay her fears. Back in Kaduna, she hastened to prepare my lunch while I packed a few things into my traveling bag. At first, I was confused about what I needed to pack. My mind raced back to what Dr. Tai Solarin used to pack anytime the police came for him. He once told the press the contents, being a habitude to detention cells. But did I remember? How long would it take them to quiz me? I mused. Whatever the duration, I needed a change of clothing, pyjamas and toiletries. Packing finished, lunch ready, I ate disinterestedly. It was due to my wife's persuasion that I even ate the little that I attempted. After that, we had a short prayer, then I kissed my kids with a promise to return soon. As events turned out, I was wrong. I left with the military boys in their jeep and was taken to the Air Force Base Kaduna, where two other officers of the same unit, CSC, Lieutenant Colonel Ibrahim Usman, one-time ADC of President Shagari, and Captain Abiodun Sesi were also waiting to board the G-22 military transport aircraft detailed to convey us to Lagos. We took off by 4.30 p.m. for Lagos via Makodi. In Makodi, we picked up some Air Force personnel and their families who were traveling to Lagos. Among the passengers was Quran leader Gabriel Odi, who did not know himself he would be implicated later. We arrived in Lagos by 7 p.m. and were immediately whisked into a waiting military jeep and sandwiched in between some soldiers. The journey from the airport to Ikoi, where the military investigation panel was sitting, was one of the roughest rides I ever had. At first, I thought they were going to be execution ground, then I realized it was done deliberately to disorientate us. That we were not involved in an accident that night indicated the luck that lay ahead for some of us, though in varying degrees. It also showed how rough some military drivers could be or how dexterous they are at evasive driving techniques. At last, we reached our destination, number 3 Hawksworth Street, Ikoi, where the MIP was sitting. The time was 8 p.m. The driver went to report our arrival. It looked like the MIP was not ready to take on new suspects, so we were again driven off in a fury. Our next stop, Rafinadi's Dungeon, Inter Center, near Alagmon Clues. This place was once thrown open by Mohamed Gambo of the Nigerian police for the world press to see where Buhari's regime incarcerated as suspects and victims of oppressive rule. As we drove into the place, we stopped at a big metal gate, a toot on the horn, a ring, then a peep through a hole before one side of the metal gate was open. This was our real destination. We jumped down and were directed to a man on duty who freaked us and documented us. We were then taken into dark rooms where we had to grope our way through. Moses, welcome, a voice rang out from one of the rooms. It was Colonel David Akko, a colleague at the staff college. He must have heard my voice. I answered him absent-mindedly. In my cell, I groped for a bed and found one, then changed into my pyjamas, said my prayers and then lay down to sleep. Sleep did not come. On answered prayer, what was wrong? Sin or lack of faith, I asked myself. If it was lack of faith, is it not said that faith shines brightest in the dark? I mused. In the adjoining rooms, I could hear some people chatting in whispers. I was still rolling on my bed and battling against mosquitoes 
begging for a wink. When I pressed my cat's watch to know the time, it showed 5.30 a.m. Again, I prayed for sleep. It came. I was woken by the bang of a door on the room to my left an hour later. The longest night I said to myself. December 22nd, 1985. Though the time was 6.30 a.m., the only sign of daybreak was a streak of light that came through a hole on the wall. After a short while, I stood up, groped my toiletries, crawled to the door only to realize it had been locked from outside. It was then I knew what the bang that woke me up was meant for. I also banged on the door and after a few minutes, a guard came to open it. I asked for the toilet and was shown the way. Outside my cell, I met some detained officers who told me about the other persons also in the dungeon. The list was staggering. After I had taken a bath, one of the guards brought my breakfast. The room was so dark that he could only drop the food at the door. As for me, having been there for several hours, my eyes had partially got accustomed to the darkness. I was so hungry, I simply gulped the plates of porridge and bean cakes. This breakfast provided insufficient. A few minutes later, the guard commander came to inform me that I was needed for interrogation. I wore my uniform and went out. Outside, Usman and Sisi were waiting. We were again driven to number 3 Hawksworth Street, accompanied by armed guards, but this time the driving was somewhat civilized. At 3 Hawksworth Street, we were separated and led into different rooms. The room I was taken to contained a twin bed, two cushion chairs, and a small table. It was a self-contained air-conditioned room with wardrobe. It must be bogged, I said to myself. I was there alone for 15 minutes before a steward came in and asked what I would like for breakfast. Though I had already taken some breakfast at the intercenter, I asked for scrambled eggs, sausage, toast, and tea. Since the question was an open-ended question, I made an order which I thought would be difficult to meet. When I was served 30 minutes later, I ate hungrily and disbelievingly. Was the food to fatten me for execution or to soften me up for a verbal drill? I was still trying to answer this when the steward came in to clear the plates. No sooner had he closed the door behind him than my interrogators strolled in, all smiles meaning no harm. So it seemed. The eldest and best dressed among them opened up. Good morning, Colonel F. Young. How are you? Hope you have had your breakfast. He capped these with a handshake. He was cultivating me. Well, Cutsy demanded I should appear friendly to and exchange pleasantries. These I did. When I asked for his name, he gave me a false name, one which I realized later during the trial. After my interrogation, I was asked to put into writing all that I had said, which I did. Yoshi was invited to confront me with what he had earlier said about my involvement in the coup plans. He repeated what he had written, that he told me about the coup plans. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Yoshi was another instructor. From where I'm staying? The Nigerian army attracts some of the best brains in the land. If you follow it, it runs from right to left or left to right. It really doesn't matter. You, you can see the ridge, right? Yes, sir. Um, but exactly whereabout is the farm? The farm land. Yoshi was seen as one of Nigeria's most brilliant up and coming officers. Just about, yes, I Mohammed is just about right. In December 1985, he also was arrested and accused of being one of the coup leaders. The charge against him included treason, a capital offense. I think this is best to encapsulate part of the interrogation into something like this. Moses, you're an intelligent officer. You know you come from a minority area. What would you have gained from a coup? Nothing at all, I bet, you know. Me too, I come from a minority area. Just toiling for others to reap. It's always a lot you'd agree. But that's all for me and you. Now reveal all you know about the coup. And if you open up, you'll see that it would soon be over. And you won't be tossed up and down. Mike Yoshe says you're a friend. And as a friend, he told you their plans. And that you knew and agreed to all. So what are you talking about? He further says you're his neighbor too. As close to his house as you are to their plans. Therefore, you are neck deep in this, so why are you wasting our time? Moreover, you were course mates as cadets, so you see this is further proof that you are a conspirator too. 
So whom are you trying to fool? We also know two of you are Jaji colleagues as directing staff in command and staff college. Colleagues at work must be colleagues in crime. So Moses cooperates with us. Furthermore, Mike invited you to Makodi, where the plans were discussed in full. Why did you refuse to attend? A clever plotter you think you are. To cap it all, you gave Mike a ride, during which he briefed you on the plans. The conspiracy charge is therefore confirmed. See you then at the stake, my friend. I denied any knowledge of the coup or any invitation to go to Makodi. I agreed that Lieutenant Colonel Yoshe and I were cosmates, neighbors and fellow instructors at Command and Staff College Aji. But our friendship had been strained by some events of the past two years, to the extent that he could not have confided in me such sensitive issues as coup plans. I then went on to narrate the events that strained our relationship and why he wanted to rope me in.